Good morning. We pre. Glad that everybody's out this morning. If you're visiting with us, you're honored guest. I invite you back at any time. As we prepare to worship our God, we'll sing 542. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you so much for another day you've blessed us with, for another opportunity to come here this morning, to learn another portion of your word, Father, and to come worship you. I ask you please be with us this morning as we go through our worship service, everything that we say and do may be pleasing and according to your will. Please be with us, be with the men who are leading us in our service this morning, please be with them. Please be with Jason as he's about to present his lesson to us, help us to be attentive and to help apply the things that we learn today to our everyday lives to be better Christians and examples to the ones around us. Let's get you please help us to live our lives for you and we'll be pleasing to you Father help us to overcome the many temptations that we face. We we'll just look to you you would strengthen us spiritually and to help us to make those right decisions. As you please be with the ones that we mention on our prayer list each time we meet here and the ones that are added at this time. Please be with them. Be with the uh, ones who are sick. Please restore their health. Be your will. And be with the families who are mourning loss of loved ones at this time. Please comfort them as only you can. And Father, we just ask you, please continue to be with the leaders of our country and 
throughout the world. They can uh, come to peaceful resolutions and be with the ones serving in our military uh, throughout the world. And in this country, please be with them. And if it be our will, they'd be able to return back to their homes when they can. We ask you, please be with us as we go through the service. Please continue watching care of us and forgive us for all many sins we commit. This is things in Jesus' name. Amen. to our wondrous story counted once a month Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of, Father the, of God the Father. What is perhaps one of the greatest passages of Paul's writings, Philippians chapter 2, where he speaks of the exalted name of Jesus and how wonderful it is. It's a passage that many people have memorized, and in fact, it's a passage that some believe was an early Christian hymn, and it would make a great hymn, wouldn't it? If you think of verses 5 through 11 there in Philippians chapter 2. Just consider the, the rhythmic nature of those words, perhaps from its original language in the early Christians singing the exalted name of Jesus. We, we sang of a wonderful Savior in the song that 
Scott led us in just before the lesson. We have an exalted Savior with a name above every name. It's a powerful name. What does your name mean? Has anyone ever given you the backstory of your name, the significance of it? Maybe there's a story behind your name. I can think of my kids and the significance of their names, and Chloe in particular. She was given a name that uh, my grandmother had, my grandmother Chloe. A lot of people refer to uh, her as Chloe, but I always called her Grandma Chloe. She died when I was uh, a teenager of Lou Gehrig's disease. She was a wonderful woman, and we decided to name our daughter in honor of her. I was told that my name was given to me as a result of my aunt, who said that uh, my father came to her and asked, I don't have a name for a son. So I was told that my aunt gave him the name of the, what she would choose for her son if she were to have one. So perhaps all of us have significance to our names. There certainly is something about names and the power of them. I mean, we wouldn't think of naming our children after certain people. I teach modern U.S. and modern world history, and I couldn't imagine people today giving their names, giving the names of certain iconic people in a negative way to their children, whether it's Stalin or some other type of dictator. And I couldn't imagine people burdening their child with the name of somebody like Jesus. I mean, have you ever met somebody with the name Jesus? Could you imagine trying to live up to that kind of name or being in school and, and, and the teacher for the first day of school saying, Jesus, is Jesus here? I, I don't know what that would be like, trying to live up to that kind of name. But certainly our names are a reflection upon who we are as people. The last name that we have, people associate all kinds of things, perhaps with the name that you wear, and perhaps rightfully so. We are a reflection upon our name, or our name is a reflection upon who we are. And I am a reflection upon my family because people identify behavior with names, right? Right or, or wrong, people identify who we are. I mean, when you think about a certain name, perhaps you say, well, they're nothing but trouble. They're, they're, they're a no good family, every one of them. Was that always true? But unfortunately, sometimes the name that is stigmatized to certain people are done so at the detriment, perhaps, of relatives gone by. When we think of the Hatfields, the McCoys, what do we think of? Perhaps we look at people's family history and summarize and stereotype their whole history based on the behavior of other people. You know, there is an importance of names in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there are several stories, several examples of names that were given to individuals that had significant meaning. Sometimes people's names were changed because of the significance of those names. I mean, think about in Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, where Abram's name was changed. It meant exalted father to Abraham, signifying what he would be as a part of the promise of God. I mean, God made a covenant with this man that he would bless him and that he would make him a father of, of, of a multitude, father of a great nation. Up to that point, he had not even had an offspring yet. His wife was childless. I mean, she could not have children according to human perspective. He had to, in one sense, live up to that name. But God had to bless him because through his faith in God, through his obedience to God, 
How could a man be a father of a multitude unless God could do it through his barren wife? Because that was the promise of God. It is through Sarah that I will bless you and that you will be a father of many. He would have a son of promise and his faith was confirmed. In fact, that son, his name had great significance. Isaac, his name meant laughter. We read in Genesis chapter 18 that Sarah laughs at the idea that she would become pregnant and bear a son. In chapter 21 and verse 6, when she was in labor and gave birth to that son, she said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. So Isaac's name meant laughter. There are so many other instances in the Old Testament where names were significant. Perhaps it was significant in relation to the people of God. You could turn to Hosea and read how that his children were given the names that signified God's relationship with Israel at the time. He had one child named Lo Ruhamah, which meant no mercy. For God said, I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel. He had another child named Lo Ami, which meant not my people. And God explains, for you are not my people and I will not be your God. So it can have a negative impact in that. If you turn to the New Testament, you see significance upon the names of people like Peter. His name wasn't always Peter. His name was Simon. And in fact, when Jesus first met Simon, he changes his name. Here in John chapter 1, in verses 41 In 42, Andrew, his brother, brings Simon to Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon, tell him, we have found the Messiah, the Christ. He brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Now that word means rock or stone. Would Peter live up to that name? Peter had, a, I guess you could say, a, a tumultuous relationship with Jesus in, in, in a lot of ways. He didn't live up to that name. As, as Jesus would look at Peter, and he said, upon this rock I will build my church. He's referencing Peter's confession there of him as the Son of God. And there's a significance to Peter in the name that he had. He would be a tremendous apostle. He would, even though he denied Jesus, even though he stumbled, even though he had struggles, Peter would be the one that would unlock the keys, had the keys to unlock the kingdom in Acts chapter 2. Peter would be the one that stood up and proclaimed Jesus before a crowd of thousands. Jesus resurrected. And then there's the name of Jesus himself. If you were to turn to Matthew chapter 1 and the annunciation of the birth of Jesus to those who would be significant human players in the story, Mary and Joseph, they are told that his name would be Jesus, the birth name that he would be given. And the name comes from the Old Testament word or the name Joshua. A lot of people may not realize that Joshua And Jesus are the same name, essentially. The word Joshua, or Jesus, the name means Yahweh is salvation. We typically use the word Jehovah. We sing songs with Jehovah in it, but the the original Hebrew word was probably something like Yahweh. The name of God. If you turn to Exodus chapter 3 and and 4, you read of this God confronting Moses at the burning bush. And one of the questions that Moses has is, what is your name? Who shall I tell the Israelites sent me when I go to Egypt and tell uh, the Pharaoh to let my people go, God's people go? What, What do I tell them? And the name that he gives him on that occasion is something along the lines of Yahweh. And, and, and names from that point forward throughout the Bible, you see there are references to, to glorifying Yahweh, Jehovah. Whether it's Elijah, which glorifies God, a name that glorifies God. Or a name like this, Joshua or Jesus, 
His name literally means Savior. God is salvation. It makes sense that this is the name that would be given to this child, this special child that was born of a virgin. In fact, we're told that there is, there is salvation in no other name. Over in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Peter and John have been arrested. And they're brought before the authorities. And they claim that there is salvation in no other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is something special about that name. Not just because of what it means, but because of what he would do, what he would accomplish. It was read for us from Philippians chapter 2 earlier. His name is most highly exalted. The most highly exalted name that there is because of what he accomplished. Because as Paul says, he humbled himself. He emptied himself of equality with God. And he became a man, not just a man, but a servant. And not just a servant who died, but he died by the death of a cross. And that's the power, because God raised him up. And it's the power of his servant-minded thinking of others suffering and death on the cross that gives his name such significance today. There is great significance in a name. But think of it in terms of the names of the church. The importance of names in terms of the church. Because we read in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 that Jesus said, I will build my church. It is his church. And in fact, the New Testament writers reveal that the relationship between Christ and the church is a very important one. He died for and shed his blood for the church. That's why he could say, I will build my church. It doesn't belong to anyone else except the one who died for it. As Paul, in, in having this conversation with the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 said, the church which he purchased with his own blood. It's significant because the church is his bride. And she should wear his name. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, when Paul is writing about this relationship between Christ and the church, he speaks of this, this mystery, the mystery of Christ and the church. And, and this word mystery is an interesting one because it doesn't mean something hidden now, but it was hidden before and now it's revealed. Paul is revealing this special relationship. That Christ, Jesus, has with the church. And that mystery, that, that thing that once was, was hidden but now is revealed, is the relationship between Christ and the church. And he uses this analogy of a bride. And as the bride of Christ, the church should honor him and exalt him. She belongs to him. And the church, in, in fact, should honor him by wearing his name most certainly. But what's interesting is, if you turn to the Bible, the New Testament, you see that the names of churches in the Bible are descriptive names. They're descriptive names that attribute honor to the one who has the authority over it. For example, Acts chapter 20, in verse 28, I just referenced it a moment ago when I talked about how that he died for the church. Paul says to the Ephesian elders, take, uh, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to the flock, to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. It's descriptive and attributes honor to the one who has the authority over it. Romans chapter 16, verse 16, Paul says, to the church there, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Again, descriptive of the one that it belongs to. And then there are several passages. We've been studying 1 Corinthians over the last several weeks. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. 
Paul opens that letter by talking to, uh, about the church of God, which is at Corinth. Later in chapter 10, verse 32, Give no offense either to Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Chapter 11, verse 16, if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Chapter 15, verse 9, he talks about, I persecuted the church of God. Again, 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The same name given to them in the second letter, to the church of the Thessalonians. It's an interesting name. The church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. They have no proper name. There, there is a, 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 a variety of names that are given, but they are always names given that exalt the one who it belongs to. What's interesting is sometimes churches are identified by the region in which they met. Paul will write, for example, to the churches of Galatia. Or in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 11, what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Whether it's a geographic location, where they're located, where the church assembles, but each and every time you see that the name that is given is glorifying the one who it belongs to. Now, I don't believe that it would be acceptable to say that Church of Christ is the exclusive name of a congregation that it should wear. Because it's just as scriptural to, re to refer to the church as the church of God. We see this in a number of places in the New Testament. But what is essential, whether we, name or whether we wear the name Church of Christ or Church of God is that we are faithful to the teachings and the doctrine of the one who died for us. That is the most essential thing. Yes, we are to wear a biblical name. We are to wear a scriptural name. It is to give honor and glory to the one who purchased it, who died for it. But we are to be faithful to that one, to our husband. Because we are his bride as the church. There is great significance to the name that we wear. And we should not wear names that give honor or glory to individuals, to men who start churches. We should give it solely to the one who died for it. To Christ, to our God. There's also importance when it comes to the individual disciple of Jesus. The follower of Jesus. The name that we wear individually to identify ourselves within Christendom is very important. You see, the problem arises when people start to label individuals beyond the name Christian through denominational names. Whether it, you know, it's a name that, that identifies a subgroup. If someone were to come up to you and say, ask you about your faith, if you're a Christian or not, maybe they would ask you, to get a little more specific. Well, what kind of Christian are you? Are you a Methodist Christian? Are you a Baptist Christian? Are you a Catholic Christian or a Pentecostal Christian or a Mormon Christian or a Presbyterian Christian? You could go on and on. Someone might ask, are you a Christian? If they ask me, I say yes. Well, they might say, well, what kind of Christian are you? And I would begin that point to have a conversation with how many different types of Christians are in the world today. There, there is a problem within the Christian religious world today, and it's evidence within this divisiveness that people want to use names to identify themselves. See, there's no evidence whatsoever that the members of the body of Christ were identified more specifically than the terms that are strictly used or a follower of Jesus. There is no evidence in the Bible beyond the names that were given. Like the name Christian. We're going to come back to this in just a second and, and look a little bit closer at this name. 
with the word disciple. These are the names, whether it's Christian or a disciple of Christ or even this name that's given to the Christians. Followers of the way. Again, the only exception would be the, the geographical references mentioned earlier. The Christians at Galatia or the Christians at Corinth. But if you think about that name Christian, at the beginning of our study in 1 Corinthians, we saw Paul come out very strongly against divisiveness in the church at Corinth. Paul writes to a congregation that's struggling with a lot of things, but one of the, the, the very first things that he tries to deal with is the divisiveness and in, in the sectarian nature of the church there and how that they are trying to identify themselves beyond their relationship with Jesus to say, oh, well, I'm of this group or I'm of that group. One says, I am of Paul. Another says, I am of Peter. And there, still another says, I am of, of Christ. And Paul tries to correct their wrong thinking when it comes to this, this sectarian understanding of Christianity. And he condemns this divisiveness and tries to get them to understand the unity that we are to have in the body of Christ. And that it's to be rooted in Jesus. And he goes on to talk about the gospel of Jesus in a very profound way to talk about how that it is the basis for our relationship. This word Christian, it's significant. It's only used three times in the writings of the New Testament. The very first time it's used is in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. Turn over there to Acts chapter 11 and notice how this, this word is used for the very first time in the Bible. In Acts chapter 11, it's, Paul is working with the, the church at Antioch. Eventually, he would come to Antioch and work with that congregation. But Luke is writing about this church here in Acts chapter 11. Barnabas and Saul went to Tarsus. Now Barnabas went to Saul to look for, for... Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. I'll get it right. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch, verse 26. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church... And taught a great number of people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Up to this point, the name that was used to refer to those who followed Jesus was simply disciples. People who were learners. People who walked in the footsteps of the Savior. And it's at this point, according to what Luke says, that they were first called Christians, did they call themselves that or were they called that by those who were outside the community of faith? We're not sure. It could be either. But this name was either self-given or given by other people to identify who they are. They wore the name of Christ. The word Christ is that Greek form of the word Messiah that comes from the Hebrew. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. It's not his last name, but it identifies what he came to do. And those who follow him, who are his disciples, belong to him. That's what that word means, a Christian. Over in Acts chapter 26, it's used for the second time. Where Agrippa, a Roman official, says to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Be interesting to know exactly the tone that Agrippa used when he said that to Paul. If he used a sarcastic tone, if he, he if he used a sincere tone. If you keep going, Paul, you're going to persuade me to become a Christian. Or or is he saying in, in the vein of you're just trying to persuade me to become one of those Christians? And then over in First Peter chapter four. The third and final time that it's used in, in the Bible is when Peter says, If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. I want to wear the name of Christ. I don't know about you. Call me a disciple. Call me a follower of the way. It's biblical. It's scriptural, certainly. 
And in fact, some of the early restoration leaders, Campbell and Barton Stone, had significant discussions about this. Should we be called disciples of Christ or, or Christians? And they had their feelings about it. Campbell was more in favor of wearing the name disciple because of its repetitive use. And Stone was very firm on using Christian. They're both very scriptural. And what, what we can get lost in when we start into this type of discussion is what, should, what is the name that we should wear? It, it sort of goes back to what I talked about at the very beginning of this lesson. Am I living up to the name that I wear? The name of Christian. When people know that I am a Christian, a follower of Jesus, somebody who wears his name, Am I a reflection on that name in the way that brings glory and honor to God? Or do people have a negative view of Christianity and the Bible and my Savior because of the way that I live? You see, we impact through our behavior, through our actions, what people think of us, the name of our families, but when you're talking about the name of Jesus, Christian, wearing the name Christian should affect everything about us. The way we talk, the way we behave. Because in essence, we are living billboards for Christianity. We're a commercial for Christ. We are a display. Jesus says to let your light shine so that others may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. When they find out who you belong to, does that draw them closer to God? As we present ourselves as a, as a sacrifice, holy and blameless, wearing the name Christian should affect every aspect of our lives. Wearing the name Christian should affect who we associate with in close relationships. Wearing the name Christian should affect who we choose as somebody who will be a spouse, a husband, or a wife. Wearing the name Christian should affect every area of our lives. Because it should be viewed as a reflection upon our Savior. There is great significance in a name. To bring honor and to, to bring glory to God as the church should be our number one priority. We are his church. We are his bride. We wear his name. But to wear his name as an individual, as a Christian, as somebody who wants to, to live and to walk with him in his footsteps, to follow his way, to be his disciple. It's a very powerful thing. And it can bring change and hope into the world. Hope for the world. As we share our faith, as we share our lives in the gospel, with the name that is above every name, Jesus. I think about that passage where Paul says, have this attitude or have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. See, the very way we think, our attitude, everything about us should be impacted by him. The way we interact at work, at school, outside of those arenas, in sports, do we have the attitude of Jesus? When people know that we are Christian, does that give them a positive connotation of what Christianity is all about? Or does it give a bad name to the Savior? As we think about the name which is above every name, Paul says that he has been exalted and one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. You know, we have an opportunity before that day to confess it with our own lips before others. To 
confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, to His glory. And to confess it every day of our lives with, with our words and, with through, and through our very lives. To confess, to profess that we believe that Jesus is the Christ. That it's a name above every name and that we are not ashamed to wear that name. Paul uses that, that, that idea a number of times in his writings. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I will not be ashamed. And, and there, is, there is intense pressure in our society today to try to shame people, to try to, to, to silence people, right? To keep people quiet. We don't want to hear those beliefs. We don't want to see those ideals. We, want to, we don't want to hear those views. And it's almost like People are, are, are getting the sense that you should be ashamed if you have that belief, that view, wear that name. May we never, ever get to the point where we are ashamed to wear this name. To proudly before others say, I am a Christian. And I gladly and proudly wear his name. And let me tell you why. To have a conversation with someone and help them understand the power of the gospel and how it can change their lives. But do other people see the change in our lives first? This morning, if you've never confessed that name, the name of Jesus, the name that means Savior, what a powerful thing it would be to confess that name for the very first time as you obey the gospel. To become a Christian, somebody who wears his name, a disciple, somebody who follows in his footsteps. If we can help you in that decision this morning, what a great decision that will be to help you obey the gospel and become a follower of Jesus. So maybe as a Christian, you're struggling with displaying and, 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 and living out in your world, in your place of influence, wearing that name. Maybe you're struggling and need encouragement in your faith walk. Whatever it is this morning, whatever we can help you with as the church, his body, won't you come as we stand and as we sing. Careless soul, why will you linger?
I'd like to read a passage from 1 John chapter 1, starting with verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship was with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Paul 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, told the church of Corinth that upon the first day of the week to break bread. And as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, actually, Luke wrote, the early disciples met on the first day of the week. But Paul wrote on the night in which he, Jesus was betrayed, he set up this Lord's table, the supper in which we take today. And he said that the bread was his body and the fruit of the vine was his blood. And he says, as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we are to do so in his memory. But he also said, as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim Jesus' death until he comes. So as we eat this bread, remember Jesus. As Jason spoke, he thought it not robbery. Being equal to God, he came down to this earth to be a servant in human form just like you and I. He led a life that was of love, many examples, leading us towards eternal life. But as we proclaim his death today, we are declaring that we believe that, that Jesus lived that life. He allowed himself to be crucified. We believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. As each one of us eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim that we believe that. To the world, to ourselves, and to each other. And it is his purpose. The purpose of this bread and this fruit of the vine is to believe. He also tells us that if we eat this bread and we drink this cup in an unworthy manner, we do harm to ourselves. What does unworthy mean? It doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't actually mean we even deserve it in many ways. But it means that we're going to take this for the purpose it was intended, and that is to be drawn closer to God drawn closer to Jesus and to believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Let's bow. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much today for the love that you had for us, for the love that Jesus had for each one of us that he was willing to give his life for us, the perfect sacrifice. Help us, the Father, today as we eat this bread to remember as we should. Help us, Father, to partake of it in a worthy manner. Bless us, Father, as we do so, and bless this bread, for we pray in your Son's precious name. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we continue our thanks, dear God, for the life that led Jesus to the cross, for the blood that he shed, for the cleansing of our sins through his blood, that we all might have salvation. Father, we thank you. Once again, Father, help us to drink this fruit of the vine in a way that's worthy to you, that we, Father, are blessed in doing so. And you bless the fruit of the vine. For we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. Likewise, upon the first day of the week, we were instructed to lay by in store. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 that now concerning the collection of the saints, I have given orders to the churches of Galatia 
and so do I also to you. For on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside, so, aside something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Paul was ordering the church at Corinth to lay by and soar upon the first day of the week. So when Paul comes, he can take the collection to Jerusalem to those that it was intended for. We today are laying by and store upon the first day of the week that we can help those that are in need. We help the community. We help those in the congregation. We just recently sent monies to the disaster relief in Ohio. We don't make it public. It's a private thing. We don't want to make anyone feel bad, but we are here to help. But today, as you give, we are following the directions of Paul and the church and the, the word of Jesus. And remember, Paul wrote in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 that for each one of us are to lay by in store, yes, but we are to do it as our own accord with a cheerful heart, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we continue our thanks for the many blessings of life. Thanking you, Father, for each one that we have. Thanking you, Father, for the congregation here at Little Hockey, the love that's in it. And we just pray, Father, that the love grows stronger for you and stronger for each other. Help us, Father, as we give today to give from the heart, give with love. Accept our offering, dear God, and may we use it wisely. For we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. There's a box in the back as you leave, if you have not done so already, that you can deposit. Good morning. Glad to have each and every one of you here this morning. We're very thankful for your presence. If you're a visitor, even from South Carolina, we're definitely glad to have you. Glad to see Aubrey and Chris and the boys here. We have other visitors that are with us this morning. We're very thankful for your attendance and pray that you've had an enjoyable and uplifting time worshiping God with us this morning. We have a number who are on our prayer list, um, and I'm going to have some additions to it as it was well this morning. Lois Kaplinger is in Marietta Memorial Hospital. She is in room 206, uh, 2,264 or 2,264 with pneumonia. We already know that she's having a lot of problems with her lungs, so we want to definitely keep Lois in our thoughts and prayers. She might be moved to Selby soon for rehabilitation. Lois has asked for no flowers, though. Please do not send her flowers. I have a feeling it might have to do with the, the pollen and the flowers and her lungs. So let's please make sure that we keep her in our thoughts and prayers. Sally Dixon, my mom, is here this morning. As many of you know, she was in a car accident last Sunday evening um, on her way to evening worship. Um, she stoved up pretty bad. She's sore, but she's alive to be sore and stoved up, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, her car was totaled in the accident, but uh, she is alive, which is the most important part, and we're very thankful for that. So let's keep Mom in your prayers as she continues to heal up and uh, continues to improve in her daily feelings. Uh, Missy Fleek um, had pneumonia, still has pneumonia, but she's here this morning with us. Uh, glad to see her. Um, Missy's uh, had a lot, and she, I'm going to go ahead and read her thank you here. She said, thank you to everyone who called, sent cards, and checked in on me when I had COVID, and, that, and I still have pneumonia, but I'm starting to improve. It's good to see her face. I saw Mark at the football game on Friday night, and uh, Garrett as well. So we're glad to see Missy here with us this morning, and pray that she continues to heal and keep her in our thoughts and prayers. Sister Robin is out again with us this morning. Um, she's making progress with the clots in her legs. Everything's still on task and still doing well. Jan Sisko, as Katie and Scott's brother-in-law, is dealing with dementia. Mabel Cox, that's Sandra Shute's uh, mother, is back home. Last I heard, um, after being back in the hospital, we want to keep Mabel Cox in our thoughts and prayers. Rosemary Eaton, as she continues to deal with her health. Betty Harris, that's Joe Harris's mother, cancer. Mike Lynn Harris, Joe Harris's daughter-in-law has cancer, Chris Hickerson in cancer, Denver Horn in his health, Sam Kincaid, Emily, is he out of the hospital yet? Okay, so Sam Kincaid was a former student of Emily Knowles, had been in a really bad car accident, trying to help the victim of another car accident from what I gather. Um, he is now home and he has still got a road of recovery in front of him. 
Damon Miller and his heart condition, um, Harry Miller and the cancer that he's dealing with. Harry told me this past week that he's still plugging along. That was his response to me that he's doing as well as he can. Harold Morrison and dementia, and we're also going to make sure that we get Harold's address if it's not in the back yet for where he's living right now, if we want to send cards and encouragement to him. Brother David Newberry and his health as he continues to improve. Tim Parsons and cancer, Dana Rose with his liver, Rose Warden and her cancer, and Rachel White, that's Evie Cowell's daughter-in-law, is not doing well currently. Is that still the case, Evie? Okay. Want to make sure, and I apologize, I accidentally let this one drop off the prayer list, and that's my fault, Evie. Um, Charlotte Nestor, uh, please ask her, keep her on the prayer list as she continues. Now, she's doing treatment right now for cancer. Is that correct, Evie? Okay. So she had one significant surgery, and she has more surgeries to go. Also wanted to add two others to the prayer list, Junior Fleek. Uh, which is family to Mark, of course, over um, and um, has stage three cancer and will start his chemo soon. So we want to keep Junior Fleek in our thoughts and our prayers. And also Sean Pickens, uh, someone here in the local community, friends of Missy Fleek. Many of us know the, the Pickens uh, kids that go to school at Warren. I think they're all juniors this year as well. Um, still in the hospital with COVID, but he is starting to improve. Are there any others that needed added to our prayer list this morning? I know that list seems like it's very long and extensive, but there are a number of people who are in need of our time and petitioning to God. Those who are on our sick and shut-in list, we want to keep Peggy Allman, Terry and Irene Boop, Sandra Collins, Rosemary Eaton, Harry Miller, and Rose Warden in our thoughts and prayers. We encourage you to reach out to them. Their addresses are in the back. If you need them, I'm going to be updating that sheet hopefully today with additional addresses for people to be able to reach out to them and telephone numbers. Want to encourage you to come out to our Sunday evening worship here at 5 p.m. Um, for any reason, would you be at home this evening and you would like to re, I guess, watch this morning's worship service? It will be broadcast at 5 p.m. on our Facebook page this evening. We have midweek Bible study at 7 p.m. here in person for ages for in the building for all ages. We also have a men's business meeting this evening after our p.m. worship, so we encourage our men to stay for that. I know there will be a few things on there that we need to discuss and take care of, but we want to encourage the men to be here for our business meeting following evening worship. I want to take a moment to do some congratulations. Our young people here in the congregation are incredibly busy doing a thousand things, it feels like, and sometimes I don't think that we necessarily give them all the acknowledgement for all the things they do and how well they do. I want to congratulate Edward Kale and his teammates. Uh, they are headed to the district tournament on Tuesday. They are going to be headed to Zanesville. That means, did you guys win sectionals, Edward? Is that right? No, we came second. They came in second, which means they get to go on. So they are at the district tournament on Tuesday. And I believe Edward's right here in case you can't tell since they all kind of blend together. The gentleman in the middle is one of his teammates, Caleb Davis. I believe he won ECOL Golfer of the, the Year. So he like was recognized. And he is a local, I believe, he, of all things, he's a little hawking kid, if I, if I got that right. Um, so we want to definitely wish Edward and his team the very best as they go to the district tournament on Tuesday. And I want to take a moment to definitely recognize the Lahans. Mr. Brandon Lahan is not only a senior, but he's also the state champion for Class A in West Virginia for the golf tournament. And he got to share that with his brother as they were both members of the Class A championship team uh, in West Virginia this year. So let's congratulate Brandon and um, Preston those along with uh, Edward and what they're accomplishing this year. And I promise you, the tournaments are actually getting ready to just start for all of the other kids that are in high school, let alone all the younger ones. So let's keep them in our thoughts and our prayers as they do a lot of traveling and congratulate them on an outstanding season using God's talents that have been given to them. In the way of other announcements, I have one more before I open it up. October the 23rd, it's going to be a stop and go, stop, drop it, thank them, congratulate them, wish them well, and I guess be on our way. Um, baby shower here for Andrew and Miranda Cramlett here at the building. That'll be on October the 23rd, October the 23rd. So that'll be here in about two weeks, um, less than two weeks on a Saturday. Um, there'll be a flyer for the back for details. If you have any questions, you can ask Robin. If you have any questions, you can ask Charlie. I don't know if he'll give you any answers, but he'll probably tell you to go see Robin. Um, my response to having children is diapers are always a wonderful thing.
really they are. That's the only reason I didn't want to have more was because of the diapers. But are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? If not, we want to remind everyone again of our midweek Bible study, our evening worship, and our men's business meeting this evening. If you would, we're going to stand and have a word of prayer, and then Brother Scott's going to lead us in the first and last verse of a closing song. If you would, and you're able to, please stand. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come together to worship you in spirit and in truth, to open your word and allow your word to be the truth of our lives and not our mere opinions. Father, may we carry the name of Christian proudly. May we carry that name or that title or that label of disciple, Father, humbly that we can be servants of yours here on this earth, that we can be an encouragement, be a light to those we come in contact with daily, that we can uplift, that we can share the gospel of, and your good news, that we serve a living Savior, not just one of history, but one that's alive and well today. Father, we lift up all those who are hurting and struggling mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Father, there are so many who are facing daunting and heavy and hard roads ahead, and we pray that they will not grow tired and doing the very best, that they'll realize, Father, that you have a great plan in store for them, and that, God, Father, everything is possible through you. Father, be with all of those who are not here this morning for whatever reasons. For those who aren't here this morning, Lord, because their faith has grown weak, their, their faith has grown tired. Father, we pray that we can be an encouragement, we can be, we can be a light to them, to remind them of your everlasting love and your promise to each and every one of us. Father, we love you and we praise you in all things, and it's in your son's name we do pray, and amen.